Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. Thank you so much for stopping by. I hope you're blessed by this message entitled The Spirit-Filled Workplace as we look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, and we talk about what it looks like to honor God in our work. Father, we pray for the rest of the service today. We pray for the worship through the Word right now. I pray that you'd help us, all of us, to be changed through this. And, uh, Father, I pray for worship and communion as we do this in remembrance of the sacrifice that you've made. And, uh, Father, I I pray for the rest of the worship and song time that we would sing from the bottom of our hearts and sing um, because you're worthy of praise. And that we would give because you've given us everything we have. So we give back to you as a way of of facing that fact. And Father, we just thank you so much for all the ways that you loved us and watched over us. Thank you for this day. Lift all this up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, all right, kids. Can go ahead and make your way out to Children's Church or Sunday School or whatever it officially is. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Numbers just dropped massively. <laughs> All right, so. Last time we were together and I preached, we talked about the spirit-filled family and how that godly leadership as parents doesn't mean that we'll always be popular with those we lead. You know what I mean? A good parent, in fact, at times, will displease the little ones. As they say, as happened this morning, no more donuts. (laughs) Eat your vegetables. Go to bed. That's part of our job as parents. When God puts us in, in charge of kids as parents or as grandparents, That's part of the job description. It isn't to please them. In fact, part of the problem we have in our culture today with parenting is those parents that want to be their kids' best friends. That's a great way to screw up your kids. Now, we want them to love us, and we want to be friends with them. But we also have to lead them. And so, and at times, leading them means getting them to do things they don't don't want to do. Today we're going to talk about the spirit-filled workplace. That you know, this all started with be filled with the Holy Spirit, and then it works itself out in daily life. It works itself out in in marriage. It works itself out in parents and kids, and now it's going to work itself out in our job. Now, for some of us, our job is being a mother and a teacher, and so you you don't have the same boss uh, employee relationship per se. Um, but you fall under the leadership then of your husband if you're married. Uh, but here we're going to look at the spirit-filled workplace and how those of us that do work out in the world, how do we relate to our bosses and our coworkers? Maybe you're a manager and, and you have people under you. How do you treat them in a way that shows the work of the Holy Spirit in your life? And, and, and it's an important thing. When you think about it, we spend an awful lot of our waking hours at work. On the average week. That's why vacations are so nice. Like a break, a change. (laughs) I can do what I want to for a little bit. Then of course we gotta go back to work. But um, I remember I was thinking about this message, like I I remember the worst boss that I've had to work for. Some of you right now you're probably thinking, Oh yeah, I remember that one job I had or that one boss. Uh, in Chicago I worked at an alarm company and unfortunately this guy knew some of what he was doing with installs, but not really talented at organizing and instructing people, unfortunately. And so uh, he would come in, and you never knew which bill would show up. It could be the angry one, it could be the joking one, it could be everybody's buddy. Uh, and it was just, it made it kind of scary when you, we all had to go to the office first, and then we get our assignments for the day and we go off and do our work. And so you just never knew what it was going to be like that morning. And he was very manipulative, like 
he would build somebody up when I started there. Turns out he wanted to motivate somebody else, so I became like the super child, you know, I could do no wrong. And then <laughs> I was like, either these guys are really not that good of an installer, or he's playing me, you know, and eventually it became clear, yeah, he was playing me against them to try and make them feel bad so they would work harder, and then eventually he turned it around, and, and then I was the goat for a while, and it was just sad how he treated people. And it's an example of how not to manage people, how not to lead people. And the reason that this is so important, though, is our career, like I said, we, we spend a lot of time in it. You think about it, how big of an impact does your job have on your family life when you go home after dealing with a manager like that? You know, you come home a little grumpy maybe? Come home less than excited about life? If, and, and so, how do you deal with that? How, what do you do? How can you survive under a manager like that? And that's what we're going to talk about today. So I think it's important for us to understand, as spirit-filled Christians, how do we respond? What do we do? So, yeah, the subtitle for today is How to React When Work is Tough. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 5. And he says, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Now, we are using this scripture to remind us of our culture today. How, how does this apply? We're bringing it into the modern times. Fortunately, slavery has been abolished in our country, and I don't have to be a slave to anybody. But still, there's a principle here. Slavery in, that, in Roman times was about work, and slavery in Roman times was very different than slavery in our own American history. In Roman times, it was just, we conquered you as a people. And a certain percentage of your people will be slaves. That was just the reality of life. And, and so there were slaves of every color and, and ethnic group and nation that Rome had conquered. And it's interesting. There were different, some slaves went and worked in a mine, and that was horrible. And I've heard that the life expectancy for a slave in certain mines was as low as three to six months. It was horrible. But most slaves were um, servants in a household. They did the laundry, they cooked the food, they took care of the children, some of them taught the children, and just, uh, there were all kinds of, of jobs for slaves. And, uh, and, and so uh, in ancient Roman times, about, there, in, just an example, in Rome itself, there was a million people uh, about the time of this being written. About a third of them to one estimate I heard of three quarters of them were slaves. I think the three quarters might be a little high, but somewhere in there, there was a huge number of slaves in the Roman Empire and the capital of Rome itself. And so they're everywhere. And so Paul has to address them. What happens when a slave becomes a Christian? When we become freed in Christ, what do you do? And so, um, so that's where we find ourselves today. And now again, thank God I'm not a slave. You're not a slave. You may feel like it at work sometimes. If you've got a good manager, they won't do that to you. Thank God there is a level of freedom. But even so, we can learn a lot from what God says to slaves here. And so, it, oh, it's interesting too, I forgot to add. Um, slaves became eventually part of the family. Not like children, but like uh, um we have a, an example, not full children. There's a, a, a tomb in Rome of a 17-year-old slave who died. And it says his epitaph from his owner was once a slave, became a son. And there's also record of a slave in ancient Roman times, a female slave, who fell in love with her master. Her master freed her, and the two of them got married. And so it was vastly different than American slavery, but still not the ideal. And so, you know, a lot of us come to the scripture and go, well, why doesn't God just say end all slavery? And we're going to hopefully answer that question by the end of the message today. He goes on and says, serve them as unto the Lord, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Now, not by way of eye service. You see, slaves wanted to be free. 
thousands upon thousands of slaves in the Roman Empire were freed. There was kind of an ethos of if you serve your master well, eventually they'll free you. And so what happened is when the master or his wife or the kids were watching, they'd serve really well and faithfully. But then when he would turn his back, they'd be slackers. They'd be stealing. It was not uncommon at all for slaves to pilfer all kinds of stuff from their masters. And so he's saying, face the fact that God has put you there for now, for this time, and serve the Lord and not just your master. So for us at work, even with bad bosses, God has put you, God has put me at where we're working for a time, for his kingdom and for his glory. Even though that's tough to face sometimes. And I want to go to 1 Corinthians here, chapter 7. He's, he says, were you called while a slave? Did you come to Christ as a slave? Don't worry about it. But if you're able also to become free, rather do that. And so he's saying, don't freak out. You feel trapped where you're at? That's okay. God may very well have you where you're at. Now, when he opens a door of freedom, walk through it. But even in your job today, this week, God has you where you're at for some reason, for a time. Now, he goes on and says, For he who, called in, uh, who, you know, he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. And likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. You see, you and I can learn a lot from a slave. From that submission of will, it says, I have to do what I'm told. Because, why? Because a free person needs to learn to become a slave of Christ. You go, no, I, I can't do that because my master has said no. Don't give in to gossip or greed or lust or selfishness or pride or any of those things. My master said no. We can learn a lot from a slave. And, and so in some ways, that's why I think God didn't just end slavery in Rome. That, that Paul doesn't say, this is wrong, we need to, you know, have slave lives matter movement and, you know, block the thoroughfares and all of that stuff. Why? Because we can learn a lot from the slave. You know, there are so many ways the Bible refers to us. At the end of his time with the disciples, Jesus said, I no longer call you slaves, I call you friends, because you know everything the Father has given me to teach you. And yet, Paul again and again will refer to us as slaves of Christ. There's more to our identity than just any one human relationship can impart. We need to learn from slaves. We are friends of Christ. If we know the word, if we really truly know what Jesus has taught, and yet we are still to consider ourselves slaves of Christ, bond servants of Christ, as Paul told the church in Corinth. He goes on, he says, you were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. So, you know, you could be careless in your finances, get yourself into debt, and have to sell yourself into slavery. And so he's saying, don't do that. But if you are a slave already, submit yourself to it. Learn the lessons that God has for you to learn in it. And the principle for us today, though not slaves, is God has you at your job right now for some reason. So learn the lessons that God has for you there. And be the light of Christ that God wants you to be while you're there. He goes back to Ephesians chapter 6. With good, or with good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men. Don't do it just grudgingly with goodwill, realizing you're serving God, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether a slave or free. Even in the bad days in Chicago, I had to face the fact I was serving God. God had given me this job, helped me get through seminary, and then climb out of debt after seminary, working tons of hours, even though my boss really shouldn't have been the boss, but I, our manager, technically. Uh, but I was serving not just Bill, I was serving the owners of the company, 
and they needed to make a profit so that we all had jobs, so the company stayed in business, but ultimately, I was serving the Lord. And ultimately, I was grateful for that job because I needed a way to pay the bills. I needed a way to continue working, but also, God opened the door for me to share the gospel with many of my coworkers. I was able to be a light even in that tough place. And so God has us where we are, even though we may not want to face it, he has us there for a reason. He has things he wants us to do, people he wants us to reach. And so we need to submit ourselves to that. And the overarching reason is that this life is not about moving up the ladder. This life is to be lived for the latter days, lived with heaven always in the forefront of our minds. So it doesn't matter how bad my manager is. I can be the light of Christ by being the one person that doesn't gossip against them, doesn't slander them behind their back that says, hey, you know, yeah, that probably wasn't the best way to do it, but God has blessed us with this job to pay our bills. Or what, you know, I mean, being the light of Christ can take many forms at work. In Colossians, the sister book to Ephesians, Paul writes, Slaves, in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external services, those who merely please men, but with sincerity of the heart, fearing the Lord. And this reminded me, fearing the Lord, well, in in uh, Philippians 2.12, we're all told to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling because God's at work in us. So ultimately, all of us are slaves of God. He's the ultimate authority, and then he's put authorities over us. You know, wives, it says, to fear, to reverence your husbands. Children are to obey their parents. Slaves are to fear the Lord by fearing their master serving with sincerity of heart. That's how you show that you really have a fear of the Lord. So, serve your boss at work. <laughs> it's tough. You may not like him or her. They may be hard on you. They may be doing things that they really shouldn't be. That's not the point. According to the Lord, we are to serve them as if we're serving him with fear and with reverence because he's chosen to put them over us for a time for a season. Now it's interesting, the Bible never addresses those under authority without addressing those in authority, I find. And it's interesting when you look at it in, in Ephesians, you find that Paul, by the Holy Spirit, spends a lot of time addressing slaves and wives and children. I was thinking about why is that why are each of those sections longer than the address to those in authority? And the reason I, I've come to is I think it's harder to submit to human authority because we know they're flawed. We know that human authority makes mistakes. And yet God puts structure so that the world isn't full of anarchy. So that the world isn't you know, it would go off the rails real quick if all human authority was just ended tomorrow. No more speed limits, no more stop signs, stop lights, no more government, no more army, no police force. We'd be in trouble in a heartbeat without authority. We don't understand how blessed we are in this country that we have, overall, a mindset of submitting to authority. Not everybody does. And the, the more we see that mindset going away, the worse our culture is getting. <clears throat> But now he addresses masters. Now he addresses those in authority. That he, he says to them, and masters do the same things to them. And so he was telling slaves, serve for the good of your master. And now he's going to tell masters, always seek the good of your slaves. It's kind of almost parental in what he's telling them. You know, because as a parent, I don't just give my kids whatever they want. I, I try to seek the best for them. And so I make them go to bed on time so that they're not up till 11 when they're this young and cranky the next day and terrible. Uh, you know, I make them 
eat their vegetables, finish their dinner. I, I look out for, you know, one of our kids we never have to tell to finish dinner, and the other one we have to tell every night, you know? And so it's, it's different with each kid, but I seek the best for each of my kids. And now masters or managers, bosses, CEOs, seek the best for your employees. What is the right thing to do? What's the best thing for them? He goes on and give up threatening. In Roman culture, it was thought that the best way to motivate your slaves was to threaten them, to make them fear you, and then you would get the best work out of them. And this was kind of the same idea that uh, Bill in Chicago had. Make all the installers fear me, and I'll get the best work out of them, which really wasn't true. But Paul says, don't threaten them anymore, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there's no partiality. And so what, there's no partiality. What he's saying is a, a slave who keeps his eye on the end, keeps his eye focused on heaven, and who's a, a believer in Christ and shares the gospel and seeks the good of his master, you know, shares the gospel with the family, the fellow slaves, anybody he runs into at the market, they would be rewarded just as much as the master who took care of their slave as well. And so all of us, are to live with that eternal reward in front of our eyes at all times. Because that's what he's saying here. There's no partiality. He's going to reward a master who serves well. He's going to reward a manager who manages well. A boss who, who takes care of his, his or her employees well will be rewarded by the Lord, who's the light of Christ. I remember one of our people sharing how uh, one of the people that he manages was having a really horrible time in life, and, and he sent them home early one day to go, go take care of your life problems. That's a good manager. That's a God-honoring manager. That's a way to be the light of Christ is, you know, and you, you can't do that all the time or you might you know, get played and, you know, work won't get done. But that's part of honoring God by seeking the best for your employees, those who are under, under you. And, and so we want to be those who fear God who love God and who seek the best of those over us and who seek the best of those under us. And I, I was thinking of these verses. I, I, a lot of times a fragment of a verse will come to mind and, and the easiest way to find it is our little friend Google. It's like, I know it's somewhere, subject, be subject to rulers. I know it's in there. So I, I searched and, and sure enough, it's in Titus. And it, it, Paul's writing to Titus. Titus is a pastor of a church in um, the ancient Roman Empire. And the Holy Spirit inspires Paul to say, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, and to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. This is what Titus is supposed to teach the church. Subject yourself to authorities. Now, this is during the time of Nero, or you know, one of the other horrible Roman dictators. And, and so from this, I find that we have to be, as much as we may not politically like our president, our Congress, our governor, our mayor, as long as they're not telling us to do something that is morally wrong, we do need to be subject to them. Part of the problem with democracy is we think, well, we, we, we take too much credit for being in control without facing the fact that God's ultimately in control. When you look at the history of our country, and you know that John F. Kennedy lost the popular vote, that we really, Nixon should have been the president, and yet I see that God put JFK in office, I think, to deal with the Cuban Missile Crisis and not lead us into war. I have to face the fact that God's in control. Or that President Bush lost the popular uh, election, but one in the Electoral College and led us to do what we did in the Middle East, I think God was at work. I don't know all the answers to why and what he's doing. I think God was at work. And so we've got to face the fact that he does control this world, even through our electoral process. Even though we may not like the outcome. What's Paul say to Titus? Remind them to be subject to rule. This doesn't mean that I will ever stop <clears throat> preaching against abortion and say that that's okay. This doesn't mean that I will ever say 
that it's okay for transgender people to be, men to be in the women's bathroom with my daughter. I will never stop fighting against moral wrong. But I have to face the fact, for some reason, God in his wisdom chose to allow our president to be our president. He goes on, he says to malign no one. This is tough. <laughs> it's real easy to get on Facebook and malign people, Twitter, and, and spout your, your opinions. To malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. Yikes. <clears throat> it's pretty convicting. And yet, this is God's plan for us, which is what? To put leadership in place and then for us to submit to that in every way, unless they're being immoral and ungodly. Now, it's interesting, too. I was reading the context of this passage and going, okay, let's, where does this fit in? And then I, the verse right before it, Paul's writing to Timothy, again, by the Holy Spirit. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. So even in church, God says there's authority he puts in place. Pastors and elders for a reason. And so God calls all of us in every area of our life, in work, in church, in our families, as parents and kids, calls us to submit to the leaders that he's put in place for our own good, even though we may not always agree. Because... This life is not about moving up the ladder. This life is not about me being in control. This life really is about the latter days. It really is to be lived in light of eternity. We are going to stand before God someday. And I want to hear, well done. I hope you do too. And so I want to challenge us to ask yourself each day, how can I seek the good of those under my leadership today? For everybody you lead. So as a husband, how can I seek the good of my wife and my kids? As, as a wife, how can I do what's best for the kids, the grandkids? And then as one under authority, how can I seek the good of those over me today? It's hard to do sometimes, but the Bible actually commands us to pray for the leaders, to pray for our president, our Congress, the Supreme Court, our governor. But how about those who are directly, it's easier to Pray for them at a distance. But how about, how about your boss? I probably should have done a better job of being a, seeking the good of Bill. You know, could you bring your boss coffee? Take him out to lunch? How can you show kindness and the love of Christ to the people over you? Sometimes those are the toughest people to show it to. Because, well, they're human. And again, I'm convinced that's why God inspired Paul to spend so much time instructing those under human authority to submit and then instru instructing those in positions of human authority to make sure that they're using their authority for the Lord and not for their own selfish purposes. And so wherever you are in your life today, in some area of your life, you're under human authority driving here today when you stopped at the stoplight when you did the speed limit hopefully did the speed limit when you whatever it is we are under authority in many areas of our life and god wants us to seek the best of that authority and to submit so how can you do that today ask yourself that each day just like i challenge you guys to ask yourself how can i show ask your spouse how can i show you love today by the way, I'd encourage you to continue doing that. It's great for your marriage. I know my wife appreciates it when I remember to myself. So I'm, I'm doing this too, by the way. <laughs> I'm learning as we go. Uh, I'm gaining a lot from the, the messages through Ephesians. But ask yourself now, how can I be a blessing to those under me? How can I be a blessing to those over me? Even if it's a boss that you have to do it through gritted teeth for a time to show the love of Christ. Why do we do it? We do it because God's put them in our lives for a reason, for a season. And God will reward, no matter how badly Bill treated me, God will reward every way that I was the light of Christ in that alarm company. And God will reward you in every way that you are the light of Christ where you work and where you live. 
Father, we need your help because uh, it is hard to submit to human authority. And it's in many ways it's scary to be in a position of authority knowing that you call us to a higher standard as you call us to lead. So, Father, I pray that you would help each of us to truly live in submission to you and to your authority and the, to those that you've put over us. Father, I do pray for President Obama and for our Congress and for the, the Supreme Court. I thank you for our system of government that has brought so much justice, though imperfect. Still, I'd rather live here than any place else in the world as far as our justice system Thank you for them. I pray that you'd help each one of us to submit to all of the rulers that you've put in our lives and to be the light of Christ wherever you've put us. And I pray now as we come to our time of communion, Lord, that if there's any rebellion in our lives in any area, that you would help us to see it and help us to repent of it, to turn from it, and to submit as you command to make ourselves slaves of Christ and to become servants of those above us and of those under us in human terms. Thank you for who you are, for loving us. We thank you for the sacrifice of Christ. Please bless this time of communion together. Now we pray in Jesus' name.